Hello and welcome to this week's episode of COPD Wellness. In today's episode, Russell talks to Mike Hess. Mike has been a respiratory specialist for over a decade. He currently works at a medical school in Michigan and has spent the last number of years researching various diseases, including COPD. Take a deep breath, relax, and enjoy Russell Winwood and Mike Hess talking all things respiratory. Welcome to the COPD Wellness Podcast. Today, we're going across the Pacific to the United States to talk to a very good friend of mine, Mike Hess. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Russell. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I guess for our audience, uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, your qualifications, and how long you've been interested in respiratory disease? Well, I've been a respiratory therapist for a little over a decade. Uh, right now, my, my current position, I work at a, a medical school called the Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, as I said, I've been an RT for about 10 years. My uh, focus has been on uh, COPD for the last uh, three or four years, I would say. Um, I just, uh, in researching various diseases and through the course of my career, I, I came across this group and found that it was a very underserved population, under-recognized disease process. And, I saw a lot of opportunity to uh, uh, help people live better lives and for uh, um, uh, advancing respiratory, the science of respiratory care as a whole. So it was kind of a win-win situation. It's interesting, um, your answer, because uh, so far um, a few of our guests have said the same thing. They noticed there is a void in uh, respiratory land as far as uh, people who are involved in it. And it sounds like it's the same um, in, your, in your country. Uh, very much so. We've had uh, COPD in particular has been, uh, as I said, very underrecognized for a long time. Um, our statistics nationally say that we're we're only detecting or diagnosing about half the people who are walking around with symptoms. Um, we're not using things like spirometry. We're not using our full full toolkit uh, to uh, influence people to to live better lives. And people aren't coming to clinicians with breathing problems until they're very advanced in the disease. We see a lot of people kind of chalk up their shortness of breath to things like high blood pressure or heart disease or uh, even being overweight or getting out of shape before they attribute it to any kind of lung issue. Uh, and so we're really losing a lot of time and a lot of, uh, a lot of tissue. We're waiting for people to get to a very advanced stages of the disease and then uh, trying to treat from behind the eight ball, so to speak. And it's obviously that's not, not the way we want to do things. Um, as far as um, your own your own day to day life, how does uh, how does it look for Mike Hess as far as your working life? Well, a great deal of my job these days is education. I'm kind of an oddball RT. There there aren't many of us in the U.S. who are working in the uh, outpatient world, in particular, or in particular the uh, primary care, general practitioner uh, offices. We usually work in hospitals, or uh, if we're out of the hospital, we're in a pulmonary rehab or something like that. But uh, I am actually in a primary care clinic, working alongside uh, the physicians who are treating every, you know, all the other common diseases. Uh, I like to say I give them the 20 minutes that they wish they had with their patients because uh, I don't know how it is uh, in Australia, but here in the U.S., our primary care uh, physicians and, and other providers are. Uh, very much crunched for time and they simply don't have the time uh, that is necessary to uh, manage a complex disease like COPD. So that falls to me. I do a lot of the education. I do a lot of what we call care coordination, whereas we're making sure people are on the right medications or the right therapies, you know, connect them with oxygen providers, refer them to pulmonary rehab, uh, make sure that they're getting the, the therapies they need need to optimize their quality of life and reduce their uh, symptom burden. Uh, I do a lot of uh, smoking cessation, trying to get people uh, off cigarettes, uh, which is probably the, the biggest thing people can do to improve their, uh, their breathing symptoms. Uh, and um, uh, pretty much anything else we need to do to, uh, to get them breathing better. Sounds like you're a, a bit of an all-rounder, a, a link between the patient and uh, the respiratory specialist that we don't have um, here in Australia, and I think we, we definitely we need, we need that. I guess it, it comes down to a, a numbers game as far as the amount of patients with uh, COPD in the US versus in Australia as well. When you're talking about education, um, so to the patients, what sort of topics would you cover apart from the basic uh, medication, pulmonary rehab? 
Uh, probably the most common thing I teach, and I make sure to make this a focal point of every one of my appointments, is how to use your inhalers. Uh, we found that um, probably better than 70% of the people out there who are prescribed inhalers uh, use them improperly. And if you're using them improperly, you're not getting the most clinical benefit out of it, and you're also uh, not getting the monetary value out of it, which uh, in, our, in our clinic in particular, we have a lot of the, uh, the lower economic class groups in there. And so money is, is often tight, and we want to make sure people are getting the best value for their, their health care dollar. Uh, so we make sure that everybody knows what order to use their inhalers, uh, the breathing techniques necessary to use them properly, the differences between a meter dose inhaler and a dry powder inhaler. Um, we make sure that they're physically capable of using the devices. Uh, and then uh, again, we make sure that uh, they're using them at the right times. We see a lot of times that there's, there can be confusion between the, uh, the rescue type inhalers and the, the controller type inhalers. Uh, so we try to minimize that. Um, and uh, so that's probably the, the biggest kind of education that I do. And then I also, one, once we get that optimized, I start uh, branching into things like exercise, even if it's not a formal pulmonary rehab referral, we talk a little bit about uh, good exercises that you can do uh, and starting to delve a little bit into uh, nutrition and that sort of thing too. So it's uh, COPD, we often think of it as, as just medications or just the lungs, but it's really, we're trying to take a whole body approach these days. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a, a great idea. Um, I know for my, myself, it's, it's not just about one as, aspect of the, managing your disease, it's about a number of different things. It was interesting in uh, the last podcast I did with uh, a pharmacist, Stephen Hughes, and he identified uh, inhaler techniques as one of the biggest problems as well and spends a lot of time you know educating patients about the same sort of practices or good practices should i say um, i joke around with a lot of patients and i say that uh, we're very good at telling people to take drugs but we're not always so good at telling them how to take drugs so we try <laughs> to, to fix that I, I i wonder whether it's people look at inhalers and think well they're quite a simple sort of device and you know there can't be too much to them and they don't actually think about the timing and their breathing and, and all those sorts of things when they're actually taking the dose. I think that's a big component of it. I, I think uh, between you know, even our pharmacists are often pressed for time or you know they're trying to get people in and out very quickly. And so nobody really has the time or takes the time to, to teach people how to use it. And then like you say, people assume, well, how hard can it be? You just push it and you and breathe in. How, you know, how hard is that to screw up? Uh, but we found that it really is tricky, and there is a there is an art to it, and it takes some practice. Definitely, with um, with your own day to day um, treating patients, do you find you get the chance to form a relationship with patients, or do they tend to move through the cycle too quickly for you to form any sort of relationship? In my current role, absolutely. Uh, traditionally, in, in the respiratory therapy role, we do kind of go uh, quickly in and out of, of people's lives, especially if we're working in the intensive care unit or something like that. We kind of go in, make sure everything is going well with the ventilator, and, and move on. Uh, in this role, I've definitely been able to uh, start developing some long-term relationships with people. I've got a, a few people now who I've been seeing for uh, six months or so. Uh, we've been seeing people in the clinic for about six months. And um, it's really, it's been very rewarding to see how their symptoms have improved, how their uh, technique has improved, their understanding of their disease has improved, uh, and all of those things combined for a better quality of life. Yeah, it's certainly uh, one of the things I, I, I find um, frustrating, I guess, when we talk about pulmonary rehab, for example, and you know, uh, depending on the country, it could be a six to eight week course and, and patients go through that cycle. And then many patients um, end up back in pulmonary rehab because they feel disengaged. And I wonder sometimes whether we're missing that, that link between pulmonary rehab and continuing on with some sort of exercise program and, and how that may work with their respiratory uh, therapists. I definitely think that's a fair point. I, I, one of my professional goals is to kind of get us away as a system from the idea of pulmonary rehab, where it's a thing that you're eventually going to get back to a baseline and don't have to do it anymore. 
and on to more of an idea of pulmonary fitness or, or that sort of thing, um, where it's an ongoing process and we know that it's going to be, you know, the rest of your life. We, we put people on inhalers for the rest of their lives without really thinking of it. And we, but we never even consider getting people on an exercise program and saying, this is the way it's going to be from now on. Uh, so I, I'm hopeful that uh, as our COPD healthcare policy in the U.S. Uh, matures a little bit more, we can go on to some of this long-term uh, uh, conditioning and training and uh, all that. We've talked a, a, a little bit about, um, about education. Uh, as far as a patient looking at their disease, what do you feel are the main points they should implement in any sort of COPD management plan? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, you know, it, it's funny you should ask that because one of the cornerstones of my uh, clinic's education plan is a, uh, a, a, a paper written by a, a wise gentleman from Australia called The Four Pillars of COPD Management. <laughs> uh, and we talk, those are really the, uh, the, the four things that I try to highlight. You know, we have, knowledge is the first one of those. Uh, and that's what we try to do in our appointments every time. I'm a firm believer that an educated patient is an empowered and engaged patient. And people really need to understand their disease in order to ask the questions that they need and to kind of understand what they don't know. Sometimes you go through life and you don't know what you don't know. Uh, but I want people to know and understand and be ask questions and that sort of thing. Uh, the second key, of course, is medications. Uh, and uh, I always tell people it's my responsibility to determine what medications are working best for you, uh, what type of medications, what uh, um, you know, the, the various uh, uh, inhaler forms, or do you need an inhaler versus a nebulizer. Uh, and it's uh, your responsibility as a patient to uh, follow the plan, to take your controller meds as necessary, to take your rescue meds as necessary, and kind of keep track of that so that we can figure out whether you're trending a certain way or not. Uh, the next bit of that is exercise. Uh, again, whether it's a formal pulmonary rehabilitation program or just getting out, walking around the block, having some hand weights, you know, just moving your upper body, building this, uh, uh, this muscle core here, um, that's critical. So many people get this, uh, they get this diagnosis and figure, well, if I can't breathe, I don't want to be short of breath, so I'm just going to sit on the couch and watch TV for the rest of my days. And, uh, I like to remind people that it's pretty much the worst thing you can possibly do with lung disease. Um, and uh, the fourth pillar is uh, nutrition. You, you have to find a good diet for uh, the, the individual and make sure that uh, they have access to the proper foods and they're, they're, they understand what, what it takes to, to fuel their body properly. So uh, those are really the, the key components to me. And to, to those, I would probably add trust. Um, it's important because I deal with a lot of things like uh, uh, tobacco addiction and that sort of thing. It's very important for me to develop a sense of trust with my patients. And at our very first appointment, after we do all the, the spirometry and the testing and the assessment and all that stuff, I spend pretty much the whole rest of the time making sure that um, we build a solid relationship. Um, I use a philosophy that uh, was uh, actually belonged to our uh, football coach at Western Michigan called Row the Boat, um, where basically I, I, I tell people that we're all in a boat together. You, me, uh, your primary care provider, your pharmacist, your pulmonologist, your uh, family and care team, all those people, we're all in a boat together. And if we're not talking to each other and uh, communicating with each other, telling each other what we need, coordinating our efforts, the best we can hope for is that our little boat is going to go around in a circle. More likely it's going to flip over and then we're all kind of screwed, uh, if you'll pardon the language there. But if we work together and we talk to each other, we tell each other what we need, we're open to each other's needs, we communicate uh, in, in a sense of trust and openness, then we can coordinate our efforts and all row together to get from point A to point B, where point A is where the person is now and point B is where they're breathing better and able to do more stuff. Uh, and so I really want them to be op open with me and, and tell me what they don't know. If they're having trouble quitting smoking, I want them to tell me that because I'm not going to be there to yell at them or lecture or anything like that. I want to find a different solution, that one that works. Uh, if they're not taking their medications, I want to know that because I want to know why. I want to know, can they not afford them? 
can they do they not understand how to use them? I had one person the other day who told me they didn't like to take they, they wouldn't take their inhaler because it, it tasted terrible and they had this horrible taste in their mouth the, the rest of the morning. So I said, okay, let's find something else. Let's find another thing. Let's let's work together to get you to, to stay on mission here. Uh, so the the fifth pillar I would add is definitely trust. It's a, it's a good one to add because I think if you, you can't have a, an open and honest conversation with your respiratory professional, you're not going to get the, the treatment that, that you need um, and you won't get the outcomes you need. And, you know, especially, you know, the questions about smoking, you know, I, I know myself, many patients um, try to hide the fact that they're still smoking and they do know that it's the best thing they can do is, is give it up, but sometimes it's not all that easy. So it's important to talk to your respiratory professional about that and get the help you need. Well, and unfortunately, we've had a lot of judgment in the medical community for a long time. We've had, uh, uh, I think part of the reason that COPD has kind of had a shadow over it is that it's been there's been this view that this is a smoker's disease and people knew what they were getting into when they started smoking. And so now you kind of deserve what you get and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, I, I try again to make sure that uh, people understand that they're not going to get judgment from me. Um, I understand judgment. I, I've struggled with weight for most of my life, and so I've had the, the looks. So, you know, I, I was always the fat kid, no, the fat man growing up, the jolly old fat man. Um, but you know, I, I get the looks when you know I would fly and have to ask for the seatbelt extender and all that stuff. So I, I understand judgment. Judgment's an old friend of mine, and. Uh, I don't like to, to serve that onto people, so uh, I try to make sure that people understand that uh, it's a safe place and the, the way everybody wants to be the good patient, and I've been guilty of this myself. You want to do, you know, you want everybody, you want to get that gold star when you go for your appointment. Uh, you want the, the person, that your provider to be proud of you or to, to say, yeah, they really know what they're, what they're doing, all that stuff. Um, but that can be self-defeating because if you're not really participating in the plan, uh, it's important for the, the provider to know why so that, again, we can find something that works better. Uh, and so um, I make sure everybody knows that it, it's a safe place, a judgment-free zone, all, all the cliches like that, and uh, that we can have an honest conversation and get them to, to where they need to go to get them to their goal. Yeah, that, that, that's such a, a, a true point, what you just made. Um, I had um, a, a gentleman uh, approach me about my disease um, quite a while ago now and, and told me that, um, you know, it was a smoker's disease and, and I deserved it. Um, but my response to him was, if you're overweight because you've eaten the wrong diet, do you deserve heart disease, you know? Um, if you drink too much, uh, if you do the wrong things in life that causes chronic illness, do you deserve it? And the fact is that most chronic diseases these days is caused by poor lifestyle choices. So to say that someone deserves a disease, um, I think is very narrow-minded. Um, and funny enough, when I, when I put it like that to this gentleman, he then saw my disease in a different light because he'd never looked at it like that. So, um, I mean, everyone has their story, I guess, and, and I, I suspect that's why uh, make, that's what makes you an effective RT is because you've been there, so you know the judgment issues. Okay, moving on. Um, the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, GOLD, uh, released an update last year. Uh, can you run me through some important points about this update? Uh, well, to me, the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest change was the idea, that, or the realization, I should say, that COPD is not necessarily a linear progressing disease. And what I mean by that is traditionally we've looked at this thing as having, uh, you know, you have your COPD diagnosis and then you get kind of pigeonholed into one of four stages based on your expiratory flow. And when we look at populations of people, large groups of people, we can kind of pick out trends based on those groups. But when we look at the individual people themselves, the, the FEV1 or you know, that, that expiratory flow or that degree of obstruction, we see that it doesn't necessarily correlate very well with uh, level of symptoms or life expectancy or any of the other things that really matter to most people. 
And so we've kind of gone for many years trying to figure out what, what is a better way to, to go about this staging and classification so that we can uh, more accurately target appropriate treatments to groups of people but without, you know, but, but having a practical uh, grouping of them instead of something that doesn't necessarily correlate with their symptoms. Uh, and after a false start or two, Goal has come up with this new um, treatment paradigm here. Um, which they, they released in this new, uh, the new guidelines in, in November. And what they've done is they've kind of dissociated spirometry or state spirometry from staging. You still need to have a particular level of obstruction uh, on spirometry. We start looking more at your uh, exacerbation history and your symptom level as assessed usually by the COPD assessment test or CAT um, to figure out uh, what your symptom burden is and your risk for future exacerbations because the current thinking is uh, the more you've had, the more likely you are to have another one. And so the goal is to broken that up into these four groups here where it's A, B, C, and D. It's not a linear progression anymore. We don't have any talk of the, the dreaded end stage or anything like that. Uh, instead, you're put into one of these groups based on, uh, uh, your ex again, your exacerbation history or your symptom burden based on your, the, the CAT score. And based on your categorization there, uh, we can target an effective treatment for you, ranging from group A, where you're probably uh, mostly on rescue medications or maybe one of the, the long-acting uh, antimuscarinics like uh, uh, teotropium or something like that, uh, all the way up to group D, where you might, uh, you're might you probably on uh, more than one controller medication. You might have an inhaled steroid on there. Uh, you might be on one of the, the newer classes of drugs, like the phosphodesterized 4 inhibitors. Uh, like reflumolast, and so we can more accurately target uh, treatments to population groups, uh, and again have a more practical assessment of where their uh, their real their true severity lies. Um, probably the other uh, most significant uh, change in the gold strategies is we are actually starting to move away a little bit from inhaled corticosteroids as a frontline treatment. For a long time, much as we have in the asthma world, we've looked at uh, steroids is one of our primary treatments, but we've seen that there are large groups of the COPD population that don't really have a, much of a response to inhaled corticosteroids, uh, and there's a similar group that actually has an increased risk of pneumonia, uh, and so we kind of have this risk-benefit ratio to look at, and so now we're looking at it as it's not necessarily a frontline therapy, and if we give somebody an inhaled corticosteroid and it doesn't really seem to affect their symptoms, it doesn't really seem to affect their exacerbation frequency, we can then take that away and have it be a, a fairly safe, uh, still have fairly safe and effective therapy. Um, so th those are probably the two biggest takeaways. There are a few tweaks here and there about a lot of other stuff. There's been a lot of information added for some of the new, newer therapies out there, the, uh, the experimental things like the lung valves and the lung coils that are trying to um, reduce the areas of diseased lung to help the healthier lung expand a little bit better. Um, a lot of minor, relatively minor tweaks in those areas. Uh, it was really a thorough update. Uh, they really looked uh, from top to bottom to make sure everything was uh, in line with the most current uh, data, the uh, peer-reviewed research that was out there. Uh, but uh, those are probably the biggest takeaways. Yeah, I think the whole moving away from staging and end stage, that, those type of things, is a good thing um, because I, I think that plays on patients' minds too much. I know myself, I've seen patients like to compare their disease through an FEV1 um, score, which, which I certainly have done over the years because that has been the, the, um, the way you, you measure your disease, so to speak. But in reality, reality um, we all have different symptoms. Our disease isn't the same. So what may work for one patient may not work for another patient. Um, so I think, I think it's a good idea. With, um, you're talking about the cortisol uh, steroid, um, is there a way that you found out about the link with pneumonia? Uh, there's been, there have been a couple of, of uh, peer-reviewed articles out there in various journals that draw a relationship between the, uh, between the two, and it's gotten to the point where it's strong enough now that uh, it's... It's a, it's a concern, it, obviously, as reflected in these new guidelines or these new strategy or recommendations. Um, it, it's a concern for a lot of people. And again, a lot of it comes down to risk benefit. If you have somebody who 
um, gets a lot of symptom benefit from an inhaled, inhaled corticosteroid, you're probably more likely to take the risk of prescribing it for them uh, on the, the chance that they may still get pneumonia or something like that. Um, but if they're not getting any effective uh, benefit from it, then why take that risk? Mm. Yeah, well, it's a good point, that's for sure. The other thing that uh, we've seen the release of recently is the COPD National Action Plan. How do you feel this will help patients? Uh, well, first, let me, let me say I might be a little bit biased as I was on part of the team that uh, wrote the initial draft of the, the action plan. So we met, uh, uh, if people aren't familiar with this document, this is something that's been a little bit over a year in the making. Uh, the National Institutes of Health here in the U.S., the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, called a COPD town hall in uh, uh, the end of February of 2016. Um, brought together stakeholders from every conceivable COPD group. We had respiratory therapists, we had pulmonologists, we had uh, a large number of patients there uh, providing their viewpoint. And we sat down and we figured out how are we going to bring this disease out of the shadows? How are we going to shed some light on this thing? What do we need to do? What are our target areas? What are the goals? How are we going to make this happen? And so uh, at the uh, American Thoracic Society conference uh, uh, last month, we came up with this. Uh, they finally published the uh, final draft of this national action plan, uh, which has five goals ranging from uh, empowering patients to improving research funding uh, to awareness campaigns and uh, basically everything in between. Um, I think this is, I think that go the new gold recommendations and the national action plan uh, represent kind of a, a tipping point for COPD research. Uh, I think this is the time that things are really going to start taking off. We're finally making COPD an active part of national healthcare policy here in the US. Um, we're actually making it a priority for research funding. Uh, and the, the gold strategies are calling for a lot more use in primary care, which is very much aligned with uh, what the action plan calls for. We need to stop looking at this disease as something that we wait for somebody to have a flare and exacerbation and end up in the ER, uh, and then we pump them full of steroids and antibiotics, we give them an inhaler, and then we send them home, then wait for the next time. We're seeing that it's much more effective on a, in every sense of the word uh, to manage people properly uh, on an outpatient basis so that they can continue being engaged with their friends and family and even their careers, uh, as we're seeing uh, uh, younger and younger people being diagnosed with COPD. Um, and we're making sure that uh, th this is going to, we're trying to reduce the burden on patients and we're trying to reduce the burden on the healthcare system in general. So I do think that the National Action Plan is going to be a, a, a big step forward in how we're, we're managing this disease. Um, I'm looking forward to the implementation. Um, as I believe it was Dr. Tomashaw said at the, uh, the release uh, party at ATS, um, this is when the rubber hits the road. You know, we have all these, uh, these nice thoughts and these nice theories and these nice plans, but it's going to be up to uh, the COPD community, the clinicians and the patients working together to make sure that this doesn't just sit on a shelf somewhere and collect dust. We, we have to stay engaged and make this happen. I'm excited at the, at the possibilities. Yeah, uh, and I think um, you're right. It, it's about getting that traction. And, and I think for me, the important thing is it's, it's not just something in the United States. It's, it's somewhere all over the world. And the more countries that embrace these sort of practices and, and work together uh, in implementing them, uh, the more traction we're, we're obviously going to get. Um, is, there, is there a plan um, as far as how that information is going to, to get out? Uh, well, on a, on a national level, we do have a goal. Part of one of the uh, goals in the action plan is to create um, a coordinating agency or organization with a lot of these stakeholders, again, coming together to uh, coordinate efforts and make sure that uh, uh, kind of uh, to, to have some accountability toward the plan, make sure we're um, collecting data to uh, see if we're hitting our benchmarks. And then uh, if we're not, then we're actually, then why not? Why aren't we hitting our benchmarks? What's, what is effective, what's not effective? Um, and uh, move forward in that direction. On an international level, there's actually a lot of traction also from a, an agency called the Forum of International Respiratory Societies. Uh, which is made up of groups like the um, uh, like uh, American Thoracic Society, the European Respiratory Society, 
the um, I'm trying to remember what it what it is out in the Pacific. The uh, Pan Asian Respirology something or other. Uh, Dr. Fong is going to be mad at me. He's the president of that right now. But uh, 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 the FERS is working very hard right now to uh, raise awareness of, of all of what they call the big five respiratory diseases. Uh, asthma, uh, COPD, uh, tuberculosis, uh, lower respiratory tract infections, uh, and that sort of thing. Obviously, COPD is a big part of that uh, conversation. And we're trying to adapt these strategies to an international level. As you mentioned earlier, uh, many places don't have a respiratory therapists or an equivalent physician. Some do, some have a, a physiotherapist, which is kind of a combination of a nurse and a respiratory therapist or a lung specialist type person. Um, so we need to be careful to adapt, regionalize or localize these the strategies so that they can affect uh, uh, change on a local level as well. But um, these efforts are underway, and uh, again, I'm optimistic at, uh, at their chances of uh, changing the, the paradigm. Yeah, so am I. And, uh, and I think it's getting uh, people like yourselves and patients engaged in the conversation and spreading the word, I guess, um, is the best way to do that. Moving on, as far as the direction of, of um, managing respiratory patients, Going forward, how do you how do you see that evolving or or unfolding? Um, we talked a little bit offline about telehealth. Is that one direction you can see is going to grow? I do, I do. There were a lot of uh, research presentations at ATS. Also, one of one of them that stuck out to me was that uh, pulmonary rehabilitation provided via telehealth was what we call non inferior to face to face encounters. And so basically what it's saying is that uh, patients can do pulmonary rehab from their home or from a location near their home, um, much like uh, we're, we're doing now where we're having a remote conversation. We have somebody on one end doing, uh, demonstrating exercises and uh, the people can respond uh, you know, at home doing that. Um, in addition, we have a lot of devices that are now networkable. We can have pulse oximeters that are uh, connected to, to networks and um, relaying data. Um, so we're, the, the miracle of technology, so to speak, will uh, enable us to get, uh, to provide access to these services to a lot of people who haven't been able to have them in the past. Even basic consultations, I think, are going to be a, a lot more effective. We have areas in, in the U.S., and I'm sure there, there are areas in the, uh, the outback that are similar to this where it, it's hundreds of miles to the nearest uh, real healthcare center. You might have a small community clinic that uh, can... Uh, what we were call what we refer to as as a band aid station, basically, where you, you your minor things can be treated there, but uh, it could be hundreds of miles away before you actually get to a hospital or or even a, a decently equipped clinic. Telehealth gives us the opportunity to uh, reach a lot of people who uh, it's not practical for them to drive in uh, or to uh, to reach their their local clinic uh, and provide these kind of interactions, the, this educational materials, this inhaler technique assessment, all the things that I do in my office, uh, I could do just as easily over the internet with somebody in uh, um, 200 miles away. So I think telehealth is going to be a big part of it. I think um, uh, allied health providers are going to be a big part of it. I think we are going to see a shift away from uh, um, necessarily a, a physician only um, a paradigm where we're going to see a lot more respiratory therapists in, in primary care, uh, working alongside nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more technology in general, whether it's uh, telehealth or whether it's people using uh, fitness apps or wearables, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think there are big changes afoot in the next, uh, over the next decade. I think you're right. And uh, I think it's all moving in, in a very positive direction. Um, but unfortunately, it means you're going to be busy here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. This is the sort of busy that I like. Um, I think uh, staying busy like this helps me have an impact, a uh, hopefully positive impact on uh, many people's lives. And uh, at the end of the day, that's, uh, that's all we can ask out of life. Well, that's, that's very true. Now, with all our guests, the final question um, I'd like to ask you. If you, Mike Hess, were diagnosed with a severe respiratory disease tomorrow, what are three strategies you would use? 
Uh, well, the first strategy, can't emphasize it enough, is to uh, stay active. Um, do, uh, of course, under the, the guidance of your clinician, but you know, taking into account any, any of your physical limitations or that sort of thing, but uh, staying as active as possible, uh, and staying engaged as possible. Uh, we've found that there's a distinct correlation between people feeling lonely and uh, uh, decline, both uh, mental decline and physical decline. So uh, staying active and engaged would be number one. Um, not being afraid to ask questions would be number two. Um, sometimes clinicians can get a little, uh, um, a little tense or a little nervous when they have a patient who's asking a lot of questions, but uh, as I said earlier, my philosophy as an educated patient, as an engaged patient, as a safe patient. Uh, so I, I think uh, the, the best you can, the best thing you can do is never be afraid to ask questions and make sure you're uh, educating yourself as much as possible from uh, reliable, objective sources. Uh, number three would be to uh, um, make sure you stick with uh, with your management plan, whether it's uh, exercise, whether it's medications. Um, you know, we, we're not telling people to do this stuff because we're trying to be task master, task masters, or we're trying to be mean or anything like that. We are trying to um, create the best possible plan for you to live your best possible life. So uh, adherence to those plans um, is paramount to that. And if you're having trouble with that, make sure you're open with your clinician and talking to them about it so that they can uh, find an alternative. Yeah, and they're all, all, all very good points and all, all strategies that we can, we can certainly apply. Now, you're quite a social gentleman. Um, we see you on social media. If people want to get in contact with Mike Hess or want to ask some questions, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, well, probably the best way is uh, my Facebook group. I have a Facebook group, group called COPD Navigator. Um, you can easily search that on Facebook. We do, uh, we, uh, it's basically education and support. We have a lot of uh, questions about medications and therapies and all that kind of stuff in there. We have absolutely no industry support or bias or anything like that at all. I'm very uh, clear and objective about that, and I make sure to let people know that uh, if, if I do have any sort of conflict of interest with a particular therapy or anything like that, uh, I'm always very clear and upfront about that. Uh, I take the, the objectivity of that group very seriously. So uh, that is probably the best place to, uh, to check that out. Also developing a companion website called copdnavigator.net. Uh, right now, there's not a lot there, but uh, we're developing uh, some uh, research and reference materials for the, the population there. Uh, there will be some links to the group there as well. Uh, the last way is on YouTube. Again, if you search for COPD Navigator, um, in, the, in our Facebook group, we do a weekly live show every Wednesday at noon Eastern time, uh, which is uh, Greenwich Mean Time minus five hours. Um, and we cover, we cover a half hour of a particular topic, and then we have a half hour open forum. So people are free to ask any questions, uh, whether it's follow up from that day's topic, follow up from a previous topic, or something completely unrelated that uh, has crossed their mind uh, that day. So um, those are probably the, the three best ways to go about it. Um, and I'm always happy to uh, answer questions uh, however I can. And for the folks at home, I've certainly, uh been engaged with the COPD Navigator Facebook page and and watching your live um, shows and they are very informative um, and I do like that there is no biasness it's just uh, you telling us or you imparting your knowledge and uh, patients having the opportunity to to ask questions and, and they being answered so I think that's a great great resource. Mike um, you have been very generous with your time today and I would like to thank you very much for, for being on COPD Wellness Podcast and and hopefully some stage down the track I think we might have a part two if you're interested. Absolutely, this has been my honour. I, I can uh, uh, tell you that you have been an inspiration to many of my patients both uh, in, in Navigator, I, I've held you up as an example many times of what can still be done with, uh, with a COPD diagnosis or after a COPD diagnosis. Uh, and uh, you've been a, a great example to a lot of my uh, actual patients in the real world also. Uh, you have had a, a heck of a story and uh, I'm very excited to see where, where, what path you take next. Well, if, it's, if it wasn't for, for people like yourselves, I don't think my path would be the same because I have to get my knowledge from somewhere, don't I? <laughs>
That was Russell Winwood talking with Mike Hess. Remember, you can find Russell on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all under COPD Athlete. You can also find him on his website, copdathlete.com. Be sure to tune in next time to hear all things COPD. Bye for now.